the last trip I went on, kind of catch you up on uh, some updates on that. Uh, Malawi back in June. Uh, Francis was my coordinator. There he is with his family. He was He's not a pastor. He, his spiritual gift involves coordination of other ministries. And uh, he's got a, a pretty extensive network of pastors, hundreds of pastors down there in the southern part of Malawi. Uh, and uh, as, as you may remember, uh, the greatest need there, our greatest surprise, was the lack of Bibles um, among even the pastors. And how does a pastor teach a church without a Bible, but they're doing it apparently. Uh, I'm sure they're going way off base on a whole lot of doctrine, so that's why I was there, and that's why I left materials, and that's why we're trying to, uh, we, we're interested in providing them some Bibles. Uh, the church provided some money. We had an uh, 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 individual in the church with the spiritual gift of giving that uh, asked what is, was the greatest need. I said Bibles, and uh, I also wanted to uh, uh, replace the cell phone that, uh, uh, Francis lost during the week I was there and uh, we were able to d do both of those and uh, you see that uh, recent gifts have resulted in the purchase of almost 300 Bibles and uh, as Francis the last few days has been covering me up with uh, photos that he sent in of uh, various uh, people who have received Bibles and big smiles on the faces of all of them. Uh, I know I gave out two Bibles that he had given me uh, on my way out of the airport there, and you talk about the joy uh, of a person who had never owned a Bible and never even hoped to have, be able to have one, to suddenly have a Bible in their hand. Uh, it's it's quite, uh, quite rewarding. I did ask him uh, uh, to, to provide Bibles uh, to pastors only. Uh, I'm not sure he's followed that, but uh, uh, I also asked him to provide Bibles to the three lady, young ladies who uh, served me at the uh, uh, hotel the week I was there because one of them had begged me for a Bible, and uh, I, I was not able to give her one. And I said, please make sure, and that's, that's her on the uh, left of that bottom right picture. Um, we are continuing to be in touch with Francis. Uh, he he uh, emails often, a little more often than I like sometime asking for money and donations and, and talking about the needs of, of the country, but uh, you'll probably one day wind up going back to Malawi. All the rest of them, I've told them that, no, you're on your own. It's your responsibility now. I didn't tell Malawi that because they are such a low level of education and uh, preparation to do it on their own. Uh, next trip up, uh, we've got planned for Uganda. Um, it is uh, generally in central, East Central Africa, and we're looking at December. Uh, I have had some um, heart issues that have uh, kicked in this, this summer with uh, the heat, triggered by the heat, so I'm a little concerned with the heat being right there on the equator. Uh, there is no such thing as cool weather, no electricity, no air conditioner, no cool water even to drink. Uh, just bottled water at room temperature. So uh, I, I, I do have a procedure scheduled uh, called a um, ablation to go into the heart. Uh, on uh, they got it now set for October 24th. The doctor's comfortable that six weeks is plenty of time between that procedure and uh, being able to get on the plane. Uh, I, I don't have tickets yet, but I expect to leave about the 6th of December. Arrive on Saturday. Uh, I'll, I'll drive three hours to uh, the little, a little small town from Kampala over to uh, Mubindi. Uh, Kampala is the capital. You see in Tibi, right below Kampala, you may remember, may, uh, remember uh, the, 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 uh, in Tibi as being where the airport is that I'll be going into, uh, where the uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization uh, terrorists uh, hijacked a uh, French or, or an uh, Israeli airliner in France and flew it down there when uh, Idi Amin was was in charge, and then the Israelis sent their commandos into that airport and uh, and rescued them. Uh, about a three-hour drive over to Mubindi. Uh, pa uh, Pastor Asa wants me to speak at his church on Sunday. I don't look forward to that, but uh, uh, guys, got to give me the uh, 
the courage and the strength to do that. Uh, I don't like being the center of attention among a big congregation, including this one. Um, then on Monday, we start at, uh, he wants to start about 11 o'clock, go to 5 each day uh, with the classes, and uh, go through the rest, through Thursday, so four days of classes. The other days will start about 9, so about seven hours of classes a day. Uh, the elevation of the country is fairly high. You see the lakes. Uh, lake Victoria is the largest lake in Africa. It elevation is about 4,700 uh, feet above, uh, 3,700 feet above sea level. So it's higher than the highest point in Alabama. Hopefully that'll help a little bit on the temperature levels, but uh, there are a lot of mountains around uh, the lakes, and then uh, they feed the Nile. This is the source of the Nile River. Uh, you see the two branches that meet up up uh, at the top of Lake Albert and then go on north. That's the Blue Nile. The White Nile branch uh, comes from Ethiopia and joins the Blue Nile and goes on up through uh, Egypt and out into the Mediterranean. Give you a little idea of the geography. Uh, expect uh, p possibly as many as 200. It uh, probably won't uh, approach that quite that number, but th there, uh, Pastor Asa Tagumi is, uh, has, he started out uh, associated with um, Village Ministries International, VMI, with whom I went to uh, on a trip a few years ago to India. Uh, but then he switched over to Grace Inter Evangelistic Ministries, GEM, uh, Moses, uh, on Rubico out of Nashville and has been working through them for the last several years. Moses has made a, a, at least two trips, maybe more, to uh, Uganda. Recently, just a couple months ago, uh, Moses was in neighboring Kenya just to the east and Asa made a trip over there to attend that conference in Kenya. So they, they uh, GEM knows Asa quite well. Uh, in co sharp contrast to my last trip to Malawi where they had never met uh, uh, Francis and he was a complete unknown to everybody but uh, I've got a tried and true friend here who uh, I, I look forward to meeting and he will be taking care of me the, the whole time meeting me at the airport etc doing all the coordination but he does have his own church in, in uh, uh, there that he wants me to speak at as I said uh, he's associated with about a hundred pastors, and they have all been here, been listening to Moses, been listening to VMI before that, uh, been studying the uh, materials that uh, that those two organizations provide. So I assume that they're going to be fairly up on the principle of grace, grace salvation, but probably not a whole lot beyond that. I will be concentrating a little bit more this time probably on the uh, aspects of the Christian way of life uh, under grace. Uh, just as we, the very week that we first wrote, that GEM first wrote to Asa and said, would you like for Broadhead to come over, he's available. Uh, GEM got an email from a pastor, David, who is from the capital of Kampala. And he said, I'm, rep I, I'm from a Pentecostal, somehow it, a, it turned out to be a Pentecostal organization. I represent about 100 pastors, and we have discovered GEM online and have been studying your materials. We would like for you to send somebody over to teach us and expound upon what we've been studying. So they said, oh, by the way, we've got a guy who's, uh, who's uh, expect planning on coming here in a few months. So... Uh, anyway, we've gotten David and uh, Asa together. Uh, David says that a lot of his pastors are not going to be able to come because of the distance to the west there. Um, so far, I have not considered a second week in Kampala, but I, I do plan to, uh, been thinking more about it and, and probably will propose that as a possibility in order to get more pastors. But at the least, we, uh, if we do it just the one week, stick to just the one week, um, looks like we'll probably have somewhere between 120 and, and the, the 200 max, uh, all pastors, uh, in addition to locals that, uh, from the local church that will probably show up. 
uh, if it's a more mixed congregation with a lot of Pentecostals, no understanding of grace, then I'm going to have to certainly, and I, and I will uh, certainly spend the time on, uh, on the basics of salvation and uh, the, the eternal security, etc. You've seen this before many times. This is the, uh, the, the thing, these are the things that are covered. Very basic the first day, but it's necessary to understand who God is and why it is necessary for him to do the work that we are un incapable as humans, imperfect humans, of meeting his standards without his input, without his empowerment. And, of course, that's where grace comes in. We go through the aspect of uh, understand the concept. Grace is a policy. Uh, grace, salvation, a permanent status. I hit the, the, uh, hard the doctrine of eternal security. 20 reasons why you believe in eternal security. I deal with passages that seem to dispute eternal security and give the background, the context, uh, explain those. Uh, then I deal with the Holy Spirit's empowerment, power of Bible doctrine in the soul, application in testing, go into why Christians suffer. That has had a tremendous impact on some people who have been undergoing great testing, as I've told you in the past on past trips. And then the reward system, which ties it all together and shows us why grace is necessary and then uh, that even though some people sin and don't live a perfect life, but if they believed in Christ, they're going to wind up in heaven with, as I tell them, with a bare naked resurrection body, but otherwise there. Uh, but there's going to be great differential in how we uh, wind up in, in eternity uh, for, forever. God is fair. God is just. His justice does not come in denying us eternal life just because we commit a sin. But uh, based on, uh, on uh, our, our faith in Christ, and uh, then the rewards come in eternity in proportion to our deeds on earth, our, our function under grace. Uganda is almost twice the size of Alabama, actually about the size of Alabama and Mississippi combined, but it's about ten times our state population, so very densely populated both in the cities, the few large cities they have, actually Kampala and Entebbe, and then, uh, uh, of course, the countryside. About, about, about one and a half million in Kampala, so one and a half times the size of Birmingham, greater Birmingham. I told you his average elevation uh, well above sea level. English is the official language, although most people do not understand or not conversant in it. Uh, they still speak their native language that predominates in the, in the various ethnic uh, tribal regions. I will be in the western part of the country, so therefore Luganda is the language. My lessons are being translated uh, in writing in, into Luganda. They will all have a copy of that. And uh, as I speak, I will have a translator that will uh, translate into Luganda language. Uh, Swahili is more predominant in the northern, northeastern part of the country. Uh, decent literacy rate, you say 67%, more male than female. But uh, key there is that very few advance beyond the seventh grade, so they can read, write, rith do arithmetic, but uh, beyond that, very little education. But that is a plus. That's, that's still a big, pretty big step up from what I saw in Malawi. 85% Christian, pretty good size uh, Roman Catholic po uh, population, comparable size of Anglican, I, when I was on my second Afghan tour at the U.S. Embassy in, in, uh, in Kabul, I was well, part of our Bible, or lady in our Bible study was from Uganda, from Kampala. And I plan to contact her. I still have her email, and I'll let her know I'm coming uh, just to see how, you know, what develops out of that. But she was Anglican, uh, which comes from the British influence. Uh, it was a colony of Britain. It was a British protectorate. Uh, as you see, for about 70 years, 
government's now parliamentary. Uh, Idi Amin, I don't have this on the slide, but uh, Idi Amin was Muslim. And in 1961, he was in the Army, and he was a sergeant in the Army. And in 1961, he and one other Ugandan soldier, sergeant, were promoted to, by the British to first lieutenant. And they were the first two Ugandan soldiers to be promoted to an officer level because up to that time, the British had controlled and only British soldiers could be officers. So they led, they had the NCOs, the, the cadre uh, as, as locals. And then uh, the next year, uh, in 62, when uh, the Brit uh, Britain pulled out and started turning the government over to the locals, uh, he, uh, Idi Amin was promoted to captain and then worked his way on up. So by 1970, he was commander-in-chief of the Ugandan army. And uh, in the next year, in 71, he staged a coup against the, uh, the, the president and took over and declared himself to be the president for life. And then all the things that you hear about uh, this horrible dictator from 71 to 79, when he was, he was finally overthrown, people got tired of his rule, and uh, the, the army had, had dissent, dissenters, in, uh, dissenters in, in, in their midst, and they overthrew him in 79. So uh, that's the history, a little brief history of Idi Amin. He was Muslim, one of the, a great minority from the northern part. Most of the uh, Muslims are apparently uh, in the north, uh, uh, near, nearer to... Uh, South Sudan. There is some current conflict in the north between rebels and government forces. I won't be in that part of the country. Uh, does, the the uh, article I read did not say, but probably uh, has something to do with the, uh, the Muslim influence. I don't know. Uh, needs, the translation is being done by Asa. Uh, we did buy him a computer. His computer had broken, so we bought him a computer, so he is now translating, and hopefully we'll have that translated into Luganda. He will have the lessons printed, depending on how many, I'm estimating maybe $5 a copy uh, per person. He said that he wanted $10 per person to uh, put them up. A lot of these people will be traveling long distances and will, will stay overnight each night, so they will need to be fed, housed, etc. Uh, and it's going to be on mats on the floor, I'm sure, but uh, uh, that's, that's life over there. Prayer support, I certainly need that for my procedure, for my recovery prior to leaving. And uh, I, when I, I'm on these trips, I am very, very, very aware of the artillery support being provided by your prayers. An infantryman out on the front lines, he hears that artillery uh, shells landing behind the enemy lines, and he's hoping it's killing a whole lot of those guys. But uh, I don't hear it physically, but I know it's there. I'm very aware of it in my soul. Just a few photos I took off the Internet from the country. It is a game preserve. A lot of the typical African animals, they do have a lot of uh, destination-type preserves there. Uh, Asa suggested that I stay an extra couple of days after the course. Uh, so far, I don't plan to do that. If I do add a second week, I'd certainly probably uh, uh, get, get to see some of these. Since I'm there, uh, but right now, I plan on coming straight home the next day. Uh, you see some of the density, uh, even in the more rural, poorer areas of the uh, thatch roof, typical African huts like I saw in Malawi, dense modern city, Kampala, some beautiful country with the lakes, mountains, people typically wear western style clothes, but they do add their own African uh, uh, patterns and colors, uh, just beautiful clothes in general. The few minutes I've got left, I want to uh, pass along some of the, the types of things that I, I teach, uh, specifically uh, the, the, when I get into the uh, function of the soul, 
and the building up of the soul with Bible doctrine. We teach that a lot, we, uh, those concepts a lot here, but uh, uh, I've pr probably got just a little bit of a different twist to it. Uh, I've shown you this, this uh, slide before, the, the human soul within the big box. We call it a left lobe, right lobe. I don't like that term uh, when going into a, a, a country like this where I'm only going to be talking to people for four days and they're trying to figure out this left lobe, right lobe. It, you know, it's, it's, it, it doesn't communicate. Uh, uh, so I, I call it what it is. I, the, the, the parts of the soul, the functions of the soul that, that come, that we inherit, that uh, are developed in the womb on the left side there, and uh, the, the, then the functions on the right side of, of the chart that we learn uh, from, from the day of birth on. We start to pick up. We start to remember things. Uh, we develop a vocabulary. Vocabulary is necessary for us to put it into categorical storage so that when we talk about a horse, we go to, we know vocabulary horse, we go to that, and then we start picturing a horse and the different types of horses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, maybe uh, events that we've had with a horse or we sent a ho saw a horse show or you know, all these things uh, are, are categories. Uh, and, of course, uh, we want to talk about, uh, relate it to Bible doctrine uh, uh, as, as we get into, in, into our discussion here. Uh, as we develop that categorical storage, it's a frame of reference for us to go pull from. We develop a sense of what is right and wrong, norms and standards for life, and then as all this starts, all this information starts to meld together, uh, it develops into what we call wisdom. In other words, it is at now, this knowledge is now applicable. So from uh, life, it's applicable to life. Uh, we've got a subconscious, a lot of junk goes into that, a different subject, uh, not time for that, uh, this discussion. Sin nature, we, it comes with a body, uh, it's not part of the soul. Our soul, everything, everything that's in our soul, when we die, is going to go with us. Everything in our soul is going to go with us. So nature won't go with us. It stays with the body. So it's not part of the soul, but I put it there at the bottom because it affects both sides of the soul. I slant it to the left-hand side because it comes at birth along with the body. But it definitely affects the right side as well. Human spirit is activated at the moment of salvation. We are not born with it. It is not part of the human soul, but it is a permanent, once it is activated, because we have eternal life, uh, eternal security, it is a part of our uh, being forever. So our being consists of our soul in human spirit. Putting it all into operation, this is Ron's um, faith cycle, as he calls it. Bible doctrine taught, Holy Spirit brings it through the human spirit where it is made understandable. Without a human spirit, the natural man cannot understand uh, spiritual things. It goes into the memory center. We act on that doctrine that is understood. We act on it in faith to believe it, and then it is put into our norms and standards, our conscience, and our wisdom center. From there, it is available for the Holy Spirit to pull it out and help us, show us how to apply it to life. And again, we act on it with our volition. I emphasize volition. If you don't get anything else out of this, this discussion here, Concentrate on volition there on the left-hand side because it is so key. Our volition chooses to believe. What do we believe for salvation? We believe Jesus Christ is our Savior. Our volition is required to make that choice. We make a volitional decision. For learning Bible doctrine, after the point of salvation, we make a volitional decision all the way through that cycle. There were three points there that I pointed out that we make that decision. And then we trust the Holy Spirit. We make a volitional decision to trust the Holy Spirit. Who do we trust for salvation? It's a person, Christ. Who do we trust for empowerment after salvation? Holy Spirit. 
why is our faith, why can we not consider our faith as much directed towards the Holy Spirit on a, on a conscious decision day by day as back at the point of salvation, we're, we're very aware of our faith being directed toward Christ. I, use, I show several analogies that the Bible uses, uh, Paul, primarily Paul, other writers a little bit, uh, use to describe the soul and its function. But my favorite, I guess that's the engineer in me, uh, looks at the uh, spiritual house or the structure. Uh, and, and Bob Thiem used to teach it as uh, a structure that's being built up. He called it edification complex of the soul. Fancy term, but it's, it's, it's just he, he showed a number of floors and levels to build up that structure. Uh, so the two primary scriptures are in Ephesians. You see uh, it talks about your God's household being built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets and then being fitted into a holy temple in the Lord. You're being built up together to a dwelling of God in the spirit. And then the passage in Ephesians that we often we used to quote uh, as referring to spiritual gifts, uh, that, that uh, these communication gifts are to build up the body of Christ. Now, a, a, uh, as an engineer, a good engineer knows that any structure is no stronger than its foundation. And we, we see a couple of verses there that uh, re reference Jesus Christ as our foundation. Now, when I say foundation, I'm, I'm all ears because I deal with crack foundation or foundation problems, crack buildings because of foundation issues. And a believer who does not believe in eternal security does not believe that he is saved no matter what has foundation problems. And the whole structure is going to have cracks all in it all through his life because of that failure to believe. So that's why I hammer so hard on this issue of grace, salvation, and it being a permanent, permanent possession. When it says Jesus Christ is our foundation, it's talking about our salvation, our faith in Christ as being our foundation, and it's got to stick. The next floor, and I adopted these from, uh, from, from Bob's uh, themes, uh, teachings uh, from many years ago. I uh, made, made some uh, variations here, uh, as you might be aware if you studied him. Uh, but uh, one... One, the, the first thing, the first attitude that we must have is that of humility, realization of who God is and his sovereignty in his uh, infinity, in his perfection. We can't be that way. We can't be God. We can't be perfect. We can't be infinite. And the only way we're going to have a relationship with him is through allowing him to do the work. That is the definition of grace. Uh, so that is the very that floor is the very start of the Christian way of life, from even including salvation. But in, in, then after that point, uh, filling the Holy Spirit is very basic. It, it, he is He is our empowerment. He is our empowerment. Our faith, as I said before, is directed must be directed towards Him to do that work. Uh, we talk uh, in here about putting off the old man. Well, an unbeliever can put off the old man. That's, a psychologist can tell an unbeliever, just make a decision and make a, make, decide to change and, and, and not, not uh, to, 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 to your, your past norm and standards, whatever it was, don't do it anymore. We are under grace. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives us this empowerment. He is the one that must do it. Our faith must be towards him to put off the old man. Huge principle. We must put off the old man, but we do it through our trust in the Holy Spirit's power to do it. Knowledge of God's word, 
very uh, key con or basic concept for those of us in this church. That's why we go to this church and not some other church that uh, feeds you pablum. We want to know God's word. And as we saw with the human soul, everything on the right side of the human soul, and we fill it up with God's word, it is our choice what goes in the right side. We don't have a choice about our parents and what we learn from our parents. Our parents teach us, taught us about God, or they didn't teach us about God, or they taught us there was no God. So we don't. We, we, a lot of things we learn from the time that we're uh, uh, babies on up that are not our choice. But as we get older, what goes into that right side of that soul, that learned side of the soul, is our decision. It's our volition what goes in there. And that's why we are sitting here ready to learn Bible doctrine and make a volitional decision to do so, to show up, to listen, to hear, and to, uh, and to believe that word and then to apply it to life. Faith rest is what I call the next floor, the next uh, uh, category or function of the human soul or the Christian soul in operation. And all these are going towards maturity. These are not in order. All these things function from day one to some degree. But as we go up in the floors, each, each upper floor functions more and more in relation, uh, and become more important uh, the more mature we become. <clears throat> Faith rest is an absolute rest, a decision. It, again, it's a volitional decision. I'm going to trust God to solve this problem. And on my last trip, when my, uh, my, my bag disappeared on the plane, and somebody had taken my, my bag with all, almost all my money and all my clothes and my, my medicine and everything, uh, I would made a decision. Father, I'm going to trust you through this. And it took about two minutes to, for the person to own up and say, here it is. But, you know, you've you got to throw, and, and, and at this time like that, you've got to throw one of the, one of the Hebrew, seven Hebrew words for, for faith is body slam. I'm going to throw myself on, on you in faith. And I, I certainly uh, saw, uh, sensed the function of that, uh, of that word, that Hebrew word, uh, in, in a situation like that. <clears throat> we certainly get testing. God gives us all testing. Tests get harder uh, as we go along. We still get the small tests, but every once in a while, God will throw in a harder and a harder and harder test. And tests are necessary for you to, to make progress. You go through school from grade 1 to grade 12 and on, and on through college or whatever. Tests get harder. If you didn't ever get anything more than, than uh, addition and subtraction, you never would learn algebra and, and uh, trigonometry and calculus. You grow because you're tested. Testing challenges you to learn. It challenges you to apply. And as you apply, you gain confidence that you can take on harder tests. Prayer, as I said, prayer should be, a, should be a function from day one. But as we grow and gain maturity, that prayer becomes more and more effective because we learn that God answers the prayer. Does he answer every prayer? Does he promise to answer every prayer? Every prayer that's in accordance with his will. And the mature believer learns how to word things so they are in accordance with his will. And desire things in accordance with his will. Bob talked a lot about impersonal love towards man and personal love towards God. Ron has been teaching us about that for several weeks here in James, and he emphasized it this morning. What are the two greatest commandments, Jesus said? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Impersonal love is based on the character of the one loving and not at all on the character or the, uh, how, how well the uh, uh, object of that love deserves it. Personal love is an interaction between friends, share things in common. We certainly have imper uh, should have imp impersonal love for God, but as we learn more about God, we are aiming towards becoming friends of God 
And friendship involves personal love, personal interaction, an understanding of him, knowing that he understands and loves us and considers us part of his family. Abraham was called a friend of God. That's where we're headed towards. That's where we should be headed towards and certainly hope to head towards. And then I put the cap, the roof, every building has to have a roof. And uh, this, this is the goal. As I said, all, all of these functions of the soul, of, of our lives, of this building that's being built up in our, uh, uh, in our soul is headed toward a goal, and that goal is that of maturity. Along with maturity comes maximum happiness, and as uh, Revelation, the, 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 the seven churches in Asia, uh, each one of them had a, an admonition that he who overcomes, remember that? He who overcomes will, and then there, there's a reward associated, an eternal uh, heavenly reward associated with it, which I teach in, the, uh, in, in my last lesson on rewards in heaven. Um, and that's what I call the winner status. We are aim, aiming to be winners, to be overcomers, to wear a resurrection body with tremendous decorations on it, and with direct decorations come responsibilities in heaven. The life is going to be an exciting time for those, of, uh, th those believers who have gained maturity, who have earned rewards, and uh, uh, there's no, going to be no equality in heaven. But it's going to be more exciting the more rewards we have, the more responsibilities we have uh, to uh, be able to carry out uh, fun uh, heavenly functions. And there will be a lot of purpose, a lot of, uh, uh, a, a function that God has for us up there. So anyway, I just thought I'd share, uh, I'm a visual kind of guy. I like, uh, I, I learn a, 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 you know, better sometimes with, uh, with, with diagrams and things. And I can, th these two diagrams in particular, I can picture uh, and often use them to picture in my head uh, as, as I, I meet challenges in life uh, going through on a day-to-day -day basis. It helps me to keep up with where I am. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, keep in prayer that everything will go all the plans and everything will go well uh, for this next trip uh, to include my help. Thanks. You want me to pray? Or you want to? Okay. Father, I thank you for giving each one of us a spiritual gift, for you letting us see in this church especially how valuable those gifts are and their function to each other. Uh, to make a healthy and full body for the Lord, uh, for the Lord's mission. Uh, thank you for our pastor, for the faithfulness that he's had over all these year, decades in, in teaching us. Thank you for giving us, through this process, all by grace, uh, an, an understanding of your word that, uh, that helps us to use your strength to use your empowerment of the Holy Spirit and Bible doctrine in our souls and to uh, make good decisions in life that will aim towards a winner status in, in eternity. ask you to go with us, guide us as we seek the right place for us to, to be, whether it's here, there, or in heaven. Salute you as a source of all grace in Christ's name. Amen.